it's uh, it's been a very illuminating morning so far and um i i understand there's a very big sporting event this weekend in in Liat, and i feel very privileged to be inviting onto the stage three heavyweights within the fire protection industry so firstly i'd like to introduce mark fessenden managing director of the international fire suppression alliance onto the stage Khalid Almandil, Senior Director and Deputy Commissioner of Red Sea Global, and Adam Hessel, Marketing Development Manager, EMEA, for Temprite. I'd like to do something just a little bit different. Um, rather than running through each individual's um, career history, I'd actually like them to just introduce themselves and maybe pick on some nuggets of their wisdom as they introduce themselves as specifically relevant to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So firstly, I'll start with you, Khalid. Sure. Okay, thank you, Peter. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Khalid Mendin, currently the head of the Red Sea Global Fire Rescue Services Department. Uh, our function of the department is to provide both fire emergency response as well as project reviews and compliance with Saudi building code and fire life systems. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Mark Fessenden. I'm Managing Director of the International Fire Suppression Alliance. It's a global nonprofit uh, focused on uh, active fire protection systems. So I've been uh, involved with active fire protection systems for nearly three, three decades, uh, principally in the uh, uh, manufacture of uh, water-based and special hazard uh, suppression systems. I serve on multiple NFPA committees, including NFPA 13. Uh, I'm a, an engineer by education, and I've been uh, focused on fire protection for most of my career. Hi. Hello. I'm Adam Hessel. I represent a company called Lubrizol, and I'm here to talk about Blazemaster CPVC pipe. Um, I've been in the fire protection industry for over 20 years. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. And as you can see, there's a depth of knowledge that hopefully we can extract some, some really key points out. Um, I'm going to start with the first question with Hulid. And um, I've had the privilege of working with Hulid on uh, a giga project on the Red Sea Global. And uh, the first question relates to the integration of fire safety design. So how can fire safety and emergency response strategies be integrated into the architectural design of giga projects and high-rise buildings from the earliest design stages to ensure both aesthetic appeal and safety without compromising the guest experience? Okay, thank you, Peter. Uh, excellent questions. So when it comes to giga projects and especially maybe Red Sea Global, we have various designs and very unique designs. And it is very critical at the very early stages of a project we are talking more like the concept stage or the concept master plan stage of the project to ensure there is a fire strategy report that is entitled and addressing all the difficulties that will come up later on in the projects. That also in the same time that has to serve during the operation phase. So it is very unique structure in our department that we are handling from the early stages even until after all the operation phase. So we are both in line with the project phase as well as after operation and responding to the emergencies. So in this unique structure, we are fully aware of the design and all the code compliance that uh, went over that design or even in terms of deviation, if any, or any mitigation plan that needs to be addressed and the operation team has to be aware of once the project is completed and handed over to the operation phase. Thank you very much. Uh, Mark, any, anything to add? We'll figure that out, uh, the, the green button, I guess. Uh, yeah, I think from a um, from a, an assessment perspective, you know, I think Khalid has hit on a bunch of very critical points, and that is that fundamentally, you start any project by assessing your risk and developing a plan to to address that. You know, what what are those objectives that you're trying to achieve, whether it's you know life safety or property protection, and then ultimately, how do you best deal with that and meet the needs of the client? You know, those are those are foundational elements for any design profession. 
100%. Yeah, I think it, the, the risk assessment process is key. Codes do have a whole base of assumptions within them, and the risk assessment is foundation to that. So thank you. Adam, any any other? No? No. <laughs> um, so moving on, we've, we've talked about um, technical advancements in, in some of the earlier discussions. So this question I'll address to you, Adam. Um, can you discuss any recent technology advancements that have significantly impacted fire safety engineering for the high-rise buildings, particularly in relation to active fire suppression systems? Yeah, what we've seen over the years um, is the mindset changed in terms of some of the materials and product solutions that's been used. So um, in, the U in the United Kingdom where I'm based, probably 15 to 20 years ago, the residential sector, CPVC was seen as the as the dark art. No one was going to touch it. The mythology was, well, it's plastic pipe. It's going to melt. Rewind, uh, fast forward 15 years, it's now the preferred product of choice. Um, there's a lot of data. Um, it's been around for 40 years, so there's it's widely accepted as as the preferred product of choice. We've seen that with other solution, other products on the line as well. And, uh, and Mark, sort of from a, a, a sort of a technical code perspective, um, any any additional add-ons to that? Yeah, certainly. When we <clears throat> when we think about uh, high-rise occupancies, you know, it, it, it's going to vary a lot on on use, whether it's a commercial, whether it's residential, whether it's mixed use, and ultimately, you know, how you begin to look at protection within that space. So, uh, technologies like extended coverage and residential that cover longer areas or larger areas, in some cases more effectively or efficiently than some of the traditional commercial sprinklers uh, become common designer uh, choices within those spaces and within those occupancies. Uh, certainly, as Adam mentioned, you know, innovations in terms of piping and, and piping materials uh, require a, a special evaluation. Uh, and then I would also add that uh, as construction methodologies methodologies change, how we traditionally think about protection sometimes needs to change as well. So there are things uh, related to lightweight construction and traditional, let's say, uh, conventional or standard spray sprinklers. We simply can't protect those spaces with those types of sprinklers anymore. And so we now have a recognition that you need to use special technologies that are designed specifically to address the fire hazards within combustible concealed spaces, as an example. So, you know, understanding uh, how a building is built, how a building is is being used, will ultimately allow us to figure out which is the best technology to address that challenge. Thank you for that. And, and just from yeah. Holly. and actually, let me just add an uh, interesting thought here. If we were talking about uh, high rises, like vertically, in uh, some of the projects we have, we have what we call maybe well, not we call it, but we have more of a vert uh, horizontal high rise is going to call it. So the building is really long building that's open with a very long corridor. So part and it's more like two or three stories height. So in terms of complying with the code and FLS requirement in terms of means of egress and evacuation, it's difficult to have, you know, an exit from to meet the code compliance. So we come up with uh, what uh, also provided in the code in terms of uh, balconies and patches that is considered as means of egress because of such elongated, you know, corridors for occupancies of that uh, specific asset. No, that's a very good point because with, you know, if you think about it, um, for any building, the means of escape, the horizontal element is the first and critical stage. And then by the time we reach staircases, we're going into the vertical escape, which we should should be in a safe safe environment. And just just with the um, CPV uh, pipes, the plastics, um, within the kingdom, is it ready for change? Um, I know the traditional type of sprinkler pipe work is more um, easily acceptable. Is it on giga projects likely to see some shifts having mixed systems? I think, yeah, definitely with the emerging technologies and with the vision and the unique structures and designs of the various uh, giga projects, whether it's uh, Neom, Red Sea, Gidea, and others, uh, they have to come up with the new technologies and uh, pipe material that uh, can, you know, at the same time comply with the code and the testing uh, the uh, authority having jurisdiction meet their requirement, and at the same time, that will set the function to deliver the product. Lovely, thank you. Um, it's a sort of similar question, but I'm going to put this one to Mark, looking at future trends, and what are the emerging trends in fire safety engineering? 
that could redefine safety standards for high-rise buildings in the near future? Yeah, certainly when I think about trends, you know, I think about both technologies to uh, address hazards and challenges, but I, but I also think about uh, how technology is influencing or impacting uh, the, the, the risks that we face uh, anyway. So you know, as I think about something like electric sco scooters and their placement just inside doorways, you know, that represents a, a significant risk to the occupants. It also re represents a risk to first responders that are trying to go through that doorway to either rescue or help those that are inside. You know, so beginning to understand how uh, a, techno a technology or a an element like that influences our built world. You know, certainly um, combustible cladding has, has been a, uh, a big global issue from a fire protection uh, perspective. And how do you deal with uh, new construction? Um, typically, we're, we're beginning to see an elimination of a lot of the combustible cladding uh, for new construction, but you have a whole lot of existing facilities that have this risk and hazard. So, you know, there's been a lot of studies on how, you know, uh, water mist and automatic sprinklers uh, can ultimately benefit uh, those existing types of facilities and address that hazard and challenge. And then uh, another uh, global issue that we're beginning to uh, to see as a as a hot topic is just the number of uh, stairwells and exits for occupants. You know, historically we've we've kind of relied on two uh, exits, uh, uh, two stairwells for any high rise occupancy. There's been a movement to 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 move towards a one uh, exit, and it really uh, places you know building owners and their representatives in a contrary position to fire service. Fire service who wants to have a way to evacuate through one stairwell while they attack the fire through another stairwell. So beginning to kind of look at, at uh, ways to address those. Certainly water-based fire protection, whether it's it's active uh, sprinkler systems or whether it's water mist systems, are a great way to address that fire challenge and, and fire problem. Uh, I'm, you know, we're seeing a, a lot of movement on the, the waterless side as folks become particularly concerned about uh, water usage and water availability, especially uh, in communities where you know, there's a scarcity within within that space. So uh, finding that the balance in terms of how we kind of look at protection of technology uh, is something that every uh, design professional needs to be focused on. Well, absolutely, you would think a series of points there. Um, all to be stuck, it doesn't have any place to play them on. Um, just uh, and any, any observations or trends? Yeah, just on them. Um, on the water based fire protection, whether it's it's active uh, sprinkler systems or whether it's water mist systems, are a great way to address that fire challenge and, and fire problem. Um, I'm, you know, we're seeing a, a lot of movement on the, the water mist side as folks become particularly concerned about uh, water usage and water availability, especially uh, in, in communities where you know, there's a scarcity within, within that space. So uh, finding the, the balance in terms of how we kind of look at protection with technology uh, is something that every uh, design professional needs to be focused on. No, that was a really, really good uh, series of points. Um, water mist, I think, does have its place to play in the market. And um, just, uh, Adam, any any sort of observations on trends? Yeah, um, on the material uh, aspect. So we're we're seeing certainly in parts of Central Europe where they're actually looking at using moving away from traditional concrete structures, actually using wood and timber frame constructions, which opens up opportunities for fire suppression in those regions where historically they've shied away from. So that's something to, that we're, we're keen to, to work with. Well, thank you. Thanks for that. And Khaled, from the, at the sharp end on a bigger project where sure. things dynamically change. Yeah, actually, uh, speaking of the availability of water, especially in such a remote areas where again, like Ritzy and Neom, where the infrastructure is not there that will support, you know, fire operation or even you have to build your infrastructure, the fire water system and all of that. So in some of the projects we have to come up with, you know, uh, different substitutions and if we cannot avail the infrastructure to fire, to fire the fire water network, whether for hydrants or sprinkler system. So we have to come up with temporary solutions and uh, temporary systems that will support the project to come up well to 
I mean, uh, to overcome the availability of water. It, every day is an interesting day, isn't it? Um, the next question is, is moving on to regulatory compliance. And um, I'm going to come back to you, Cardiff, on this one, because this, this one um, I know we both feel quite passionate about, is how do you navigate the challenges of complying with both local and, and international fire safety regulations during the design and construction phases? Yeah, again, excellent questions. And I face this almost on a daily basis in our project. So complying with SBC code is a must for us. But this is what's the authority having jurisdiction, the Saudi civil defense that we have to go with and we have to comply with. However, again, as I mentioned earlier, along with the unique designs and the structures of the resorts, it's sometimes really difficult to meet the code or to comply with the code. However, as I mentioned in a morning panel, it's the intent of the code that we want to meet. And uh, along with the uh, you know, support of the consultants and uh, the support of the fire engineering team in the uh, department, uh, they come up with the mitigation plans and uh, intent of ways to meet the code, however, not complying with the code 100%, just to satisfy the authority having jurisdiction to have the project approved and uh, safe for, for occupancy. Yeah, that's no, very, very good points. It's sometimes it's almost better to have no code, have a blank piece of paper, and start from basic engineering principles and build up the safety profile from that. Um, Mark, any any observations on regulatory compliance? Yeah, uh, one thing that I've, I've always said is I don't really care what the rules are. I just want to know what the rules are before I start playing the game. And it's when the rules change halfway into the game that that creates a problem. Yeah, I 100% I agree with everything that we said. Yeah, spot on. The, the other thing that I would add is it is so critical to make sure, one, you know who all the stakeholders are, from the owner to the AHJ to the design professional, you know, even to the, to, to the user of the property, and make sure that you understand what those uh, stakeholders need and expect, and that uh, you communicate through that project piece. Communication is the key to any successful project, uh, and whether it's through the tools that we utilize, through building information modeling, or project coordination, or all of those actions and activities, you know, having that communication is what's going to ultimately assure that things are done on time, things are done under budget and uh, uh, the owner ultimately gets the project they deserve and, and expect. Absolutely, I think ultimately, you know, the guest experience is something we often talk about with the giga projects and also the client requirements must all be addressed. Um, Adam, any, any issues on? Yeah, just to ensure that uh, by the time it comes down to our product line, um, that it's been put together by the right people. So training and competence is very key uh, because it's a life safety product. So any company that is involved in our piping system goes through the relevant training and certification. That is so important because at the end of the day, your reputation is on the line by the installer. So yeah, very good point. Sorry, Peter, let me just add uh, two points here. I think uh, they're very critical. That's why I want to emphasize on them. The first one is uh, Saudi building code goes hand in hand with the international building codes. And maybe specifically we're talking about also NFPA requirements when it comes to installation. We have had faced uh, some of the projects that uh, the requirement of such project was not maybe fully detailed in the Saudi building code. And of course, our uh, backup would be the NFPA requirements uh, and NFPA standards. And in our uh, projects, we go hand in hand with SBC and NFPA. So speaking on of uh, international standards and local standards, they usually go hand in hand. Uh, the other item, I think it's a very key factor for any project to make it successful is to involve the authority having jurisdiction from the very early stages and get them on board and want of your strategy and your intent and how you're going to meet the code. And this will make your uh, project successful. No, that, that was a really good point. I, I remember doing an exercise many years ago. If you, if you do a search through the Saudi building code to find the mention of a British standard, you won't find one. And all the giga projects, obviously, the international design teams are very familiar with their home country codes. And sometimes there can be confusion in the design, design process. Yeah. Um, I'm going to move on to the next question because it's, again, very, very relevant. Um, it's about sustainability and safety. Uh, this one I'll address to Adam. Um, how do you balance the demands of sustainable building design with the stringent requirements of fire safety in high-rise buildings? Well, regarding our piping system, um, we have a very good sustainability. Um, our piping system actually outperforms other materials. Um, it actually can be recycled back into its true state. 
um, some of the other benefits in terms of safety for the engineers. It's a lighter product solution. Um, so in terms of health and safety uh, for transportation. Um, yeah, and th th this is all part of the built environment, isn't it? You know, looking at the future, looking at the world out as we are now. And Mark, any? Yeah, I, I think we're all familiar with, you know, media reports and visuals of uh, buildings uh, on fire. You know, we see this fire plume, we see the, we see the losses. And, and, you know, that's one element that we don't always take credit for, right? When you, when you have a sprinkler system, when you have an active fire protection system, a gaseous system, when you have a properly designed, installed and maintained uh, system, you don't have, you don't have that issue. So you don't have all of that material that has to go back and be reclaimed and disposed of and destroyed. You don't have all of the resources that have to be used to rebuild uh, that that project after that that fire event. Uh, if you, uh, Factory Mutual did a great study back in 2010 that really showed the uh, the difference between sprinklered and unsprinklered in terms of the built environment and the contributions that uh, that we make. If we have an active system, you know, we we have such a sustainable uh, contribution within that space. You know, we don't get that from a detection system. A detection system can be a great way to get occupants out. It can be a great way to notify uh, the fire service that there's a, a fire event and get them get them headed uh, in the right uh, location. But there's a response time associated with that. And in that response time, you can lose the building. You can have significant structural damage. All of that's mitigated if you have a properly designed active uh, water-based or suppression system for your occupancy. Very well said, very well said. And Harlan, from the like a giga uh, project perspective and also based on the vision for the kingdom, <laughs> any, any observations? Sure, yeah. So I think sustainability now has been the major player uh, in the kingdom and I think everywhere else uh, to have a building sustainable and sustainable systems and what have you. So when it comes to fire protection systems, we also need to make sure that they are sustainable and they will support the function and the systems that will put out, uh, just like Mark said, in case of fires and events. So I think sustainability is now a key factor in any projects, especially in the 2030 visions and the various giga projects, that uh, every system that's being put at uh, is being studied very carefully to make sure that it is sustainable and that will support the function that it's intended for. Well, thank you very much. I think we're coming close to the, the end time. I've got one more question that will be addressed to each, each panelist because Mark touched on it at the very start about risk assessment, and I think it's quite a good, good point to close on. Um, so what role does risk assessment play in the engineering of fire safety and emergency response measures? And how is this adapted for giga projects and high rise structures? So if I can maybe start with Halid on, on that one and then. Sure. So uh, if you're talking more about um, risk assessment and maybe safety and design, if you talk about a little bit about safety and design risk assessment, because again, they go hand in hand. So safety and design is I consider it maybe it's a standalone discipline other than FLS because it's more generic. It has to deal with uh, items that is not just related to fire and life safety. It's more uh, generic uh, when it comes to giga projects. So uh, the idea about safety and design that it starts with the early stages of a project all the way until after operation. And it is very critical for any project to make it successful is to track and monitor all those, uh, what we call it design risk registers and have it in a document that is, uh, you know, communicated, being addressed by the client itself, by the different uh, consultants with action items that will reduce the impact of those uh, risks that are associated with the project. Thank you very much, Harlan. And uh, Mark? Yeah, I mean, risk assessment is the foundation of any project, right? You need to understand what your fire challenge is, right? How high is my building? How are my occupants going to behave? Uh, how are occupants going to move? How are how are folks going to respond in a fire event? How's the community going to, to, to respond? Yeah, it, it's important to foundationally know what those challenges are. And then equally important is the next step, which is mitigation, right? And evaluating, now that I know what my fire risk and fire hazard is, you know, how am I going to address it? And, um, you know, there are perfect ways to address uh, uh, 
uh, fire challenges and there are good enough. And, and sometimes there's a cost associated with those levels and you have to decide uh, as a design professional, okay, what, what is my risk tolerance and ultimately what's going to be the best uh, way to mitigate that with, with, within the value that I have associated with a particular project. Yeah, definitely. I think the key word there was risk tolerance. You know, there's the do nothing, there's the gold star, or there's the cost effective response. And Adam, just to close out, uh, any comments? Yeah, just on the on the risk assessment, actually, and if you look at a high rise, you know, our, even the personal stuff, personal effects that we have within the home has changed. So um, I don't know, much like you in, in my household, I've got much uh you know we're, we're moving with technology and the which brings a greater fire load risk so again even the, the things that we have in our own homes becomes um a greater risk so again it opens up opportunities for suppression 100 percent. you know 10 years ago we wouldn't be talking about electric scooters uh, battery storage is big risk but they are and what's going to be the next 10 years you know when we're building um at the moment, based on the current codes, we don't know what future risks will be. But I'd just like to maybe put out to the audience for questions and just like to thank the guys because that really was an interesting series of uh, responses. And thank you.